Well, our speaker this morning is uh, Rachel Winslow. Uh, a lot of you, a lot of you know Rachel as uh, the director of the uh, Westmont uh, off campus, the Westmont in Santa Barbara program, and also as an assistant professor of history. I know her as a uh, energetic, delightful, creative, and ebullient. I like that word. Just. Look up a bullion in the dictionary, it'll say, uh, see Rachel Winslow, uh, uh, sister in Christ. And uh, Rachel, I'm just so glad we finally got you up here. So let's welcome Rachel Winslow to our... Father Greg Boyle's book, Tattoos on the Heart, is filled with glorious stories about his work in the Boyle Heights neighborhood in Los Angeles. A neighborhood rife with gangs and crime and poverty where he is both a priest and a social entrepreneur. He started Homeboy Industries so that former gang members could get jobs working in bakeries, silk screen production, and catering because as Father Boyle has said, nothing stops a bullet like a job. Tattoos on the Heart has won several awards because of Boyle's masterful storytelling about the lives of his neighbors. If you didn't get a chance to read it this summer for Westmont Reads, I'd highly recommend that you do. Father Boyle will be joining us in chapel in January, and you'll get a lot more out of his talk if you uh, are have read his book. In my family, we have a saying that my husband introduced to us. When anyone in our company is tempted to share someone else's story or talk about someone else, James will remind us it is not our story to tell. He does this to protect the privacy and autonomy of others, but it has always struck me as meaningful in another way. When we are telling someone else's story, we are not telling our own. We are deflecting from an opportunity to be real and authentic and vulnerable. In this context, it would be far easier for me to gesture away from my own experiences and tell Boyle's stories from the safe posture of a third party. But then, I'd miss the chance to share my own broken story. So today, I will tell you stories about the neighborhood that I used to live in. I will draw on Boyle's insights to interpret my experiences, and so occasionally you will see his words on the screen above bringing wisdom. The quotes are Boyle's, but the examples I'll give today are my stories to tell. When I was 23 years old, not far from the age of many of you, I moved to a poor neighborhood in the inner city of Rochester, New York, with my husband James and our four-month-old black kitten. We bought a rundown house that hadn't been updated since the 1940s. There was no shower, an ancient electrical system, rats, and no real kitchen. It was essentially a massive code violation. But it had good bones and hardwood, hardwood floors in this three-car carriage-style garage. We paid $28,000. And that should give you some kind of indication of the kind of neighborhood we were moving into. Here's what I knew when we bought this house. First, I knew there was crime and poverty. Across the street from our new house, there were two drug houses. And then right next door, there was a brothel. And I knew about the brothel because my father-in-law spent one very memorable night of reconnaissance perched in our upstairs bathroom, giving us periodic updates on the illicit activities happening next door. <laughs> this is a man who grew up and lived on 100 acres in the country, and I guarantee you he'd never seen anything quite so exciting from an upstairs window. <laughs> the second thing that we knew is that most of our friends and family thought we were crazy. Case in point, James's college roommate grew up in inner city Buffalo in a really rough neighborhood. One day he pulls us aside and he says, look guys, the entire reason I went to the college I did and I've worked as hard as I did was to get out of that neighborhood. So it strikes me as really odd that you're going to choose to move into a neighborhood that looks awfully like the one that I worked so hard to get out of. And then the third thing I knew 
was that some of our friends actually got it. There was another couple from our church that lived a short block away. Their names were Kyle and Ginger, and they became our touchstones. Ginger worked at our neighborhood association. Kyle taught math at the public high school two blocks away from our house. They volunteered as youth leaders, deeply believed in how God was at work in the Beechwood neighborhood. They inspired us, and it is right to say that the stories I will tell you today depend fully on their faithfulness and devotion. They are my personal father, Greg Boyles. So, those are the three things I knew. And what I didn't know, well, that would fill volumes. But, for the purposes of time today, I will only highlight three of the things that I didn't know. The first thing I didn't know was the reality of my mobility. The first week we moved into the house was a bustle of activity. Friends were coming and going. Major projects were underway. Power tools were zooming on in the background. Amid the flurry, I suddenly heard screaming from outside my dining room window. When I peeked out, my heart sank. There was a boy, about 10 years old, being whipped by a belt. The man whipping him was yelling something about losing the money. They were standing in front of one of the drug houses, and it didn't take me long to piece together what was going on. I retreated to the basement steps and thought about what I should do. Intervene? Call 911? All of it seemed too risky. So, I decided to drive away. I told James I needed to get out of the house, so I drove to a nicer neighborhood where I could distract myself with errands for a while. And the entire time, my mind raced. What were the chances that we could sell our new house and move? Was it possible in the meantime to rent somewhere? All I knew was that I wanted to leave as soon as possible. On my way back home, driving block by block across the eastern part of the city, I had what could only be described as an epiphany. I could move. Indeed, I'd spent the better part of the last hour figuring out specifically how I could move. But my neighbors couldn't move. They didn't have the down payment saved up, or family to help out with moving costs, or the necessary wages to afford another kind of neighborhood. They were stuck. And it then occurred to me that my neighbors didn't want a child beaten on the streets in front of their houses any more than I did. This wasn't the ideal for anyone. As I continued driving, entering my neighborhood, I looked at the houses around me, and it was then, staring at the houses, houses that many have called blight, that I began to wonder how much of what I had just witnessed was the product of a host of forces that I didn't know anything about. Was the cause of this moment the corruption of one individual or a bigger story? When the incident had happened hours beforehand, I would have told you that problem was external. It was the root of someone else's sin. But the Holy Spirit granted me mercy in the hours that followed, which led me to question my assumptions and dig deeper into the causes of this moment. What does it mean to have eyes to see what is all around you? When I started to dig, I realized that this was one of many consequences of a deeply broken system. A system in which my mobility made me complicit. At the turn of the century, the beginning of the 1900s, when my neighborhood was built, it was filled with recent immigrants from Eastern Europe and Italy and Germany. With the abundant resources available during World War II because of defense spending, there were many opportunities for returning veterans after the war to buy homes with federal assistance and go to college. The former residents of my neighborhood could and did take advantage of these programs. They had assimilated into the United States and were permitted to move to beautiful new developments in the suburbs in the 1940s and 1950s. Businesses moved with them to take advantage of lower taxes. These suburbs weren't open to all, though. Some had explicit rules banning blacks and Jews and Latinos from living there. And college wasn't a way out, either as much of the federal money available wasn't accessible to minorities or the schools that would admit them. So the inner cities became the only place 
that some Americans were allowed to live, and there were few paths out. The companies that remained no longer offered stable living wage jobs, and those that were available often openly discriminated against non-white applicants. So in my neighborhood, and many urban neighborhoods across the United States, illicit drug sales became the chief economic driver. This increased crime and addiction rates, and because there weren't jobs and there was no tax base, that meant that inner city residents had inferior food and education and transportation choices. I couldn't even imagine how stressful it would be to raise a kid in that environment and how addiction would just compound the problems. While some of our neighborhood organizations and local politicians and business owners and teachers and even the police chief did lots to try to address these inequities, I realized that there was little that one person could do to single-handedly fix the magnitude of what had been broken. But I learned, as Greg Boyle also did, that when things seem beyond hard, sometimes just showing up is enough. And so, on that drive back to my house, I committed to staying in my neighborhood. I exchanged my mobility for presence. Being present doesn't mean accomplishing anything necessarily. But the gift of your presence means that you bear witness. And that can be enough. The Beatitudes is not a spirituality, after all. It's a geography. It tells us where to stand. When read this way, an exhortation like, blessed are the merciful, becomes, you are in the right place when you show mercy. So the second thing I didn't know was the extent of my fear. One of the things that I did often at my new house was walk to my friend Ginger's. We shared meals together several times a week, and we even worked out together to really cheesy 1980s workout videos. When I started these walks, it didn't take me long to realize that I was scared. I would hesitate to go out when it was dark, and definitely not want to travel more than a couple of blocks from home. Even though I had grown up in and around cities, my whiteness was never clearer to me than when I walked around my predominantly black and Puerto Rican neighborhood. I felt different and vulnerable and like a minority. I was so ashamed of my fear that I tried to hide it. And I knew, statistically speaking, that I was much safer in my neighborhood than in adjacent wealthier areas, which were much more likely to be targeted for muggings and property crime. And without gang or drug affiliations, my chances of being shot were really low. In fact, the most high-risk part of my day was getting behind the wheel of my car, where I was much more likely to be killed or hurt. But as is often the case, it wasn't the statistics that solved my fear problem. It was the relationships. The true remedy for this fear was to get to know my neighbors. So through barbecues and conversations and sharing the abundance of my backyard garden, once strangers became friends. I found Father Boyle's sentiment that it always becomes impossible to demonize someone you know as really true. Prayer walks also helped. As I walked my streets and prayed for my neighborhood, the neighborhood's concerns became my concerns. My neighbor's concerns became my concerns. And I became increasingly less fearful. After I'd lived in the neighborhood for over three years, I was walking home from Ginger's one day. This route required that I cross the street, as you can see on the map above. My house is the one with the red arrow, and Ginger's is the green circle. So I came down Denver Street, turned the corner onto Garson Avenue, and I saw straight ahead of me a 20-something black man walking toward me on the sidewalk. And I panicked but for completely different reasons than I would have panicked three years before. I knew that to get to my house, I had to cross the street. But timing-wise, I would have to cross the street before he reached me, and I knew that he would think I was crossing on purpose to avoid him. 
I thought about walking past him and then cutting back to my house, but then I thought that would look even weirder, like I was casing him or something. So I had a dilemma. What was I going to do? I decided, look, I'm just going to take the route I normally would have taken if he wasn't there. And as I got halfway across the street, I heard him talking to me. And I looked up, and he was looking right at me. And he asked, what? Are you scared of me? How brave he was to say that. And standing in the middle of the street, I let out my breath and said, oh, not in any way. It's just that I, this is my house, and I'm headed home. And I then invited him to stop by if he wanted to and to come over. He nodded his head, and he said, all right then. And he just kept walking on his way. By naming the hidden tensions, the social conflicts, the historical reality of white women being raised to fear black men, and then letting me go my way, this young man on Garson Avenue blessed the space between us, in the words of the poet John O'Donohue. And in this process, my neighbor, who I didn't know, both named my fears and then set me free from them. Compassion isn't just about the feeling, the pain of others. It's about bringing them in toward yourself. If we love what God loves, then in compassion, margins get erased. So that brings me to the third thing I didn't know, and that was the superiority that lived in my heart. So my neighbor, Bessamina, was in her mid-40s. When I first met her walking by her front porch, she introduced herself to me as the evangelist, Bessamina. I thought, wow, she really knows who she is. She'd had a hard life, born into poverty, raised by addicts, which led to her own addictions crippling health problems, but she just loved telling her testimony. She loved for people to know how Jesus had saved her. She was a respected member of her local AME Zion Church, hosted prayer meetings in her house. She was a generous and loving woman of God. Once when I was chatting with her on the street that separated our houses, I asked her what she thought about some important doctrinal truth that I had been wrestling through lately, which of course I now can't remember what exact doctrinal truth it was, but at the time seemed super important to me. And, I re and yet I remember her response to me asking her this question. She looked at me and she said, Rachel, I don't care about your theology. I just want to know your story. I want to know what God saved you from. I remember thinking that seemed so different from the kind of Christian that I was. One day I was working in my garden when Bessamina stopped by for a visit. I hadn't seen her all week because she'd had a particularly rough health season. Being HIV positive meant that she was often weak and tired. This day she seemed particularly fatigued. Her hair was wrapped in this vibrant orange batik cloth and her skin glowed with perspiration. I knew she was in pain by the way she was holding her body. Wanting to understand more about how she coped, I asked her, Bessamina, how can you suffer so much and still put so much of your trust in God? She looked at me, her eyes both sharp and kind, and with a sense of deep purpose, she began, well, let me tell you a story that my pastor once told me. There were two men, one of whom was an international chess champion. They visited a museum together, and while walking around, they stumbled on a picture, which was titled, Checkmate. One character in the etching was a man, the other appeared to be Satan. The chess champion looked at the etching, and then told his friend to go on ahead. Something about the picture bothered him, and he wanted time to study it a bit more. A little later, his friend returned, and the chess master said, we need to contact the artist who created this piece. He either needs to change the picture or change the title. 
And when his friend asked him why, the chess master replied, well, the title of the painting says checkmate, but if you look closely, it becomes clear. The king still has one more move. And Bessamina looked right at me, and she said, Rachel, don't you ever forget that when everything seems almost impossible, when there are no back doors, the king always has another move. Well, she finished her story, and I couldn't control my tears. I didn't know at the time that this was a common story in the black church, one that had been told over and over to give hope to churchgoers who faced extreme discrimination, poverty, and suffering. But I did know in that moment that Bessamina's faith was like nothing I had ever seen in my life or anyone else's. And I realized that her faith had given her an experience with the living God, and that standing in her presence, I felt fully exposed. Her faith and her hope in Christ's authority over suffering and hardship put my faith to shame. Wasn't I the one that was supposed to have it all together? Wasn't I the one with the excellent education? Didn't these accomplishments give me an edge when it came to understanding scripture and understanding God? As my tears revealed all too plainly, I had put my trust in myself. So much so that I wasn't looking for the king to have another move. I was looking to manage the chess game strategically enough so that another move wouldn't be necessary. In this lived a myth that I could insulate myself from hard things, that shame and sin were someone else's problem. My proximity to a saint like Bessamina exposed this for the lie that it is and was. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It is a covenant between equals. So what I ultimately learned is what Father Greg Boyle perhaps knows best. Putting ourselves in proximity to those who are different from us changes our hearts. And hard story after hard story doesn't bring us despair. It does the opposite. It fills our hearts with compassion and it gives us hope. This truth is never clearer to me than when I look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2 in the story of the paralytic, which I'm just going to briefly tell you is when Jesus is in his house and he's packed in with people waiting to be, waiting to hear a good word from him, waiting to be healed. And so these friends with their paralyzed friend can't make it through the door. And so what they do is they get kind of creative, um, which is really rewarded at Westmont downtown, by the way, and they rip open the roof. So they rip open the roof, and what happens is, is that people um, experience healing, and not just healing, right, but forgiveness. So I have come to believe that this story is all about perspective. Because if you are standing outside of Jesus' house, and you are standing over here, and you look over, what you see is property damage, and the violation of individual rights, and somebody cutting in line who, dang it, should have gotten there early for their seat. You see a story of invasion. But, say you're inside standing right next to Jesus, having waited for this healing for so long. And above you, it seems miraculous, somebody is coming down before you who has never walked in his life and wants to walk again. And he's not just going to be healed, he's going to be saved. He's going to be forgiven. The great grace of proximity is that you start off thinking that it's about hardship and suffering and the violation of your rights. And you end up thinking that it's about healing and hope and ultimately love. And the thing is, friends, issues from a distance, they seem unsolvable. 
They're too big and too hard and too much. And I feel this way when I pick up the newspaper and I read about the struggle of someone in some far off place with people I don't know. The remedy here is to not turn away. The remedy here is to draw closer. And I know, I know there's an irony. I get that we've bubble wrapped ourselves against hard things by choosing the best neighborhoods in which we can afford to live and the best schools that we can afford to attend. And we've done it all because we want to keep ourselves and our families safe from harm. And I get that. But when we do that, we deny ourselves the only way through to true hope. Because we get hope by sitting with the suffering and by pushing through it. And it is in that that we find true redemption for our souls. I can't imagine anyone less bubble wrapped than the evangelist Bessamina or Father Greg Boyle. And I have yet to meet anybody with more hope than they have. So when I moved into the neighborhood, I was 23 years old. I wasn't a priest or a pastor or a missionary. I had a bachelor's degree in history and political science. James was in, a P was in a PhD program in engineering, and I tell you these details because you need to know how unexceptional we were. We were unexceptional, and God met us in our unexceptionalness. He met us in such real and tangible ways that when we left our neighborhood five years later, we were never going to be the same again. Proximity to the poor gave us healing and hope that I didn't even know I needed. So I want to ask you this morning, what would it look like for you to graduate from college and move into a neighborhood that some of your friends or family would think is scary? And I want to ask you this morning, what would it mean for you to trust Jesus enough to put off grad school or the next big thing to live in proximity to the poor? I know these are big questions that require some pondering. I get that. But I do think the answers to these questions lie in your time at Westmont. And I think that you have people around you right now who can bridge the gap between these things. So maybe it's that God is asking you to go down with urban initiatives and feed people without homes in Alameda Park. Maybe that's your piece of proximity this week. Maybe it's working with Eastside Kids Club Maybe it's with Fellowship of Christian Athletes and some of the new initiatives they have in the schools. Maybe it's with Young Life, hanging out with junior high and high school kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. Maybe it's Westmont Downtown, where you want to spend time in proximity to those that are struggling with big time problems on the east and west sides. Whatever it is, what I want you to hear right now is that God is asking you to respond specifically to this. As you go forward from here today, I urge you to consider how proximity can enrich your life and faith. Proximity begun now. In the words of Mother Teresa, we have forgotten that we belong to one another. And it's proximity that gives us the grace to remember why we are here. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you.